Welcome back to the Jeremiah Show. My special guest today is Mitch Glickman. His film credits include scores for the acclaimed independent films Street of Pain, starring Steve Carell, and Proud Heart, starring Laurie Morgan, starring Laurie Morgan, along with such notable television series as he mentioned before. Uh, cheers, Life Goes On, Night Court, Grammy Living Legends, and the annual Grammy Awards telecast. So when I was in my 30s, I lived on the beach at the shores. It was high above the Pacific Ocean, up on the 14th floor, facing north with a view all the way to Point Magoo and Malibu. The apartment building was 16 stories and was right on the sand. My uh, apartment had a wall of sliding glass windows. They were always open, letting in the golden rays of the California sunshine and at night, the stars. I never closed those sliding windows and morning through the night, they were open. There was always a gentle breeze. The apartment always smelled like the ocean. I felt like I lived in a seashell filled with crashing waves and jazz. So I had a small Bose stereo in the living room and it never turned off. It always played KJazz 88.1 FM. My special guest today is a host on KJazz 88.1 FM, has a great show. Uh, Beyond Symphonic Jazz, it's heard in L.A. and it's streaming globally on KJAZ 88.1 FM. How did you get into that, uh, Mitch? Welcome back. Yeah, thank you. And that is a beautiful way to live. I love that setup. <laughs> jazz yeah, and Ocean, I, that's perfect. Jazz and Ocean. I could have get better. Uh, no. <laughs> so the KJAZ story actually takes us to another hat I get to wear. I run the music program at LACMA, which is the L.A. County Museum of Art. So there's a bunch of different concert series we do, a jazz series on Friday nights, a Latin series on Saturdays, and a classical series that's a little bit more spread out. So I get to produce those concerts. As part of Jazz at LACMA, the series keeps growing and growing and growing. We get thousands of people every week. And Xavier Oslovsky, the great LA County supervisor, since retired, huge music fan, we were talking one day about exporting LA talent. Now my premise when I took over Jazz at LACMA is it only features LA based musicians. I will argue vehemently, the greatest talent pool in jazz is LA. So why don't we share that with the world? So through a grant from Zev, we got some money to put together a broadcast of the concerts. So we partnered with KJazz. So we take the concerts, I do a little interview, in between the sets, we package it up. And on Sunday nights, there it is, two hour show for KJS Jazz at LACWA. Very well respected, very well received, and it started gaining some good traction. Now you have worldwide audience because of streaming and it's going really well. So as KJS was developing, they were looking for more similar kind of specialty programming. So I said, hey, I've had this idea for 30 years to spread the word about symphonic jazz. There's all these great records that don't fit in anybody's little cubbies, doesn't fit anybody's format, but they're brilliant. And wouldn't it be great to interview some of these creators and performers and feature these, this music that rarely gets heard. So they say, oh, that's great. Let's do it. So Beyond Symphonic Jazz is the radio show. Monday nights, 9 p.m., KJazz, jazzandblues.org is their website. You can listen on demand or you can stay up late Monday night, either way. And I get to interview all the greats. Wayne Shorter, Chick Corea, Billy Cobham, Maria Schneider, Carla Blay. Um, the list goes on and on and on. So it's really insightful. And I get to share this music that really gets heard, these projects that have orchestra and jazz elements. And it's been a blast. I was I was looking at some of your past guests, Chick Corea, George Benson. I mean, you've got some really amazing jazz musicians. Can can you go back and find the back catalog somewhere? Uh, sadly, no, because no. the way we do, yeah, because oh, of musical no. rights and things like that. Yeah. Um, they're archived for two weeks. They're on demand for two weeks on the K Jazz website, hmm. and then they vanish. <laughs> um, what's fun is I get to kind of go beyond a little bit. So Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull mm -hmm. has been one of my guests, very much into classical music these days. 
Um, it's done a lot of work with string orchestras. So again, these great recordings that nobody's heard of. They know Jethro Tull. But look at this, what he's done in the last 20, 30 years. Mm. Um, I just had Linda Ronstadt as a guest. Wow. So most people know Linda. Oh, she's a great singer, all the pop stuff. Um, but talk about multifaceted. Yeah, yeah. So Spanish language music from her roots, which is beautiful. She ended up teaming with Nelson Riddle, a great jazz arranger, best known for his work with Frank Sinatra. Did a whole bunch of albums with her on jazz standards. She's worked with Frank Zappa, doing some very experimental stuff. Carla Bley, she sang in a jazz opera. Mm -hmm. So there's all these sides that of Linda Ronstadt that nobody knows about. Wouldn't it be great to share all of that? So that's what the show is about, to share these kind of maybe off the beaten path, or you know them for one thing, but they do right. so much more. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. And speaking of doing so much more, let's go back a little bit here. This 68 piece orchestra that you put together. You, you mentioned that your, uh, your mentor, uh, the, the person that you really discovered symphonic jazz and developed your career under when he passed away, Mm -hmm. I think you said in 2000 or around there, yeah, 2000. you, uh, 2001. So you, I mean, there obviously I imagine was a mourning process. Did you go through what type of emotions did you go through? Were you, were you for a moment lost at all? Uh, did you, did you right away know you wanted to start and carry on his tradition with the symphonic jazz orchestra? How did that transpire? Yeah, I mean, I always knew there to, that yeah. this was something that needed to keep going further and further and further. And in some ways, we were just scratching the surface, even though we did all these wonderful things. So sadly, he got quite sick towards the end. So it was a bit of a protracted transition. But yeah, I've always known that this is something that needs to go on somehow, some way. Um, so yeah, so after his passing, it's like, all right, let's get to work. Started from ground one, new board of directors, new fundraising, new everything, new title. Let's get to work. So yeah, so we worked really hard that first year to have a super big concert, all ready to go, some new commissions, some great older works. This was going to be amazing. Concert set, September 26th, 2001. This is two weeks after 9-11. So clearly that concert never happened. Mm. We rescheduled for November. Nobody was ready to come back to the concert hall. That got canceled. We didn't debut until March of 2002. Concert was amazing, great. But at that point, after three concerts, we were $50,000 in debt. So here we are, a brand new group, 50 grand. Do we just fold it in and just write it off and just say, hey, that was fun? Or if you're stubborn like me, you keep going. It took us 10 years to get out of debt. And we slowly built our way back out and just kind of built it up, built it up. Um, there's a wonderful education program that was born through the work of the Symphonic Jazz Orchestra called Music in the Schools. So we started with four classrooms. We're now in 167 classrooms all across LA County, specifically in under-resourced neighborhoods. We work with Watts in Compton, Long Beach, Lenox, um, kind of South Central Los Angeles to bring the arts, to bring music to schools and communities that have had very little in the schools. And I want to talk about that in our next segment. We do have to take another yeah. break, but I, I would definitely want to get in and, and talk about that work. I think that's so important and uh, really congratulate you for that work and thank you. Um, why though, before we go to break, mm -hmm. Jack Elliott, how big was his band? And same, then, every, yeah, 68? same model. 68, okay. sometimes it was 72 if we could squeeze in some extra string players. But it was almost the same players. So the, the template was the same. Um, Is there a reason for that template that I'm, uh, do you Yeah, think? I mean, I think. The, the basic premise is you take a standard symphony orchestra, which is about 70-ish players, you take a jazz band, which is about 16 players, smash them together. Now there's a lot of overlap within that. So it comes to be about, you know, close to 70 musicians. This is a fairly standard kind of setup 
So yes, yeah, so we use those models. Um, and there are chamber groups, there are groups around the country that have um, similar ideas. There's a group in um, the Netherlands called Metropole Orchestra. And they've been doing this since World War II. They started as a radio orchestra, kind of light fair, as they say. Over the years, they brought in some very hip music directors and started doing similar things, putting, you know, jazz orchestra together. They're about a 50 piece, maybe not 50, somewhere in there, 48. Um, and they've done some great projects over the year. So they're the big daddies. They've been doing this for a very long time. We're on our 23rd year, which is pretty amazing in and of itself. But yeah, there have been, and there's a group in South America that kind of does a little bit. So yeah, there's things that kind of come up. And listen, the LA Phil will do a symphonic jazz concert. They'll play Rhapsody in Blue and other things like that, Leonard Bernstein's music. So it's not like we're the only people playing this genre. Orchestras will do it. We mm -hmm. know how popular Rhapsody in Blue is. So yeah, so our And then in comparison, really what's an orchestra uh, amount in an or a typical orchestra? It's about, you know, 70 to 80 players. It's really the string section that can get a little bit bigger, more contracted, but the rest is pretty standard. So yeah, so our idea is to perpetuate through our commissions. And that's kind of what keeps all that going. Create maybe, who knows, the next Rhapsody in Blue. Yeah, well, you guys are creating some pretty beautiful music there. Go to sjomusic.org and click on Music in the Schools. We're going to talk about that. I think it's so important what you're doing there, the Music in the Schools program and throughout Los Angeles and, and uh, Southern California there. Um, we're going to hear some more on the soundtrack here. We'll, uh, I'll have Mitch talk about it on the, on the other side of the break here, talk about what we're listening to. You can see uh, and, and experience celebrate the Rhapsody in Blue Centennial with Symphonic Jazz Orchestra and very special guest, piano soloist Marcus Roberts. That's on Saturday, May 11th. It's uh, 7 p.m. They've got a pre-concert talk with Marcus Roberts and Symphonic Jazz Orchestra music director Mitch Glickman, who happens to be my special guest this hour. That talk is followed by a performance of Robert's extended version of Rhapsody in Blue. That's at 8 p.m., the concert. You can go to sjomusic.org and get your tickets. And we're going to give uh, two VIP tickets away here, courtesy of Mitch Glickman and the Symphonic Jazz Orchestra. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 